morning. That's a good thing. <laughs> Lord bless us with another good day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, let's see here. Let's take our Bibles. We're going to go. Let's, we're launching out of Joshua chapter 20 as always uh, for this series uh, of the cities of refuge. We're moving on to a new refuge. Uh, it's the one that's Bezer. We, we talked about uh, Kadesh, our holiness, and what we have there uh, in our in, in permanent holiness and perfect and positional. We studied Shechem, which means shoulder. In Christ, we've got strength and burden bearing. We talked about and studied Hebron, our fellowship. So in Christ, we have fellowship and communion. Today, we're going to study Bezer, and that means fortress. It means fortress, and uh, of course, you, you probably uh, heard the song, the, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, uh, and that's exactly what he is, amen? Uh, but uh, the series is going out of Joshua chapter 20, the first nine verses, but uh, we're, we're going to skip through, we're going to skip through down here because we've got a lot to cover, uh, but I want to encourage you, if you forget, you know, kind of how this goes, this was all about... This was all about someone protection for places, a place of protection and sanctuary from an avenger of blood if somebody accidentally or unwillingly killed someone. Uh, this was not a premeditated murder thing, and then we're just hiding you out. This was a you know you did it negligently, or you just you, you weren't aware somebody died of what you did, you know, and so it protected that person till they could take their, you know, cause before the elders and, and, and have that cause judged and sufficient time went on until the high priest of that day uh, had died. And then they could go back to their, uh, they could go back to their homeland, to their house uh, there and continue on. Uh, so there's a lot of time goes by during that, but uh, Bezer is fortress. First Samuel chapter two, verse two, the Bible says there is none holy as the Lord, for there is, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Um, you know, there's a lot of rocks, and I've I've been on mountaintops, I've been I've been places. I mean, we we went hiking through the West Maui Mountains. I mean, we went we climbed and jumped off waterfalls and uh, stuff like that. So. I've been in a lot of a lot of rocky areas. I've, I've stood on some pretty tough rocks, but there's nothing that compares to how solid of a rock that we have in Christ Jesus, and how we're how how He put us on that rock. Our fortress is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most important things that we can do as a Christian is to learn to trust Him. That's not, it seems to be easier for kids to trust him than, than adults. Have you noticed that? I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus said that unless you become as little children, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven. You've got to learn to trust with all that you are. Uh, because kids just put their whole self in, in whatever they, they trust in, if you notice that. So we need to do the same thing. Paul, toward the end of his life, said, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The Christian life is a learning adventure. There is ups, there is downs, there are highs, there are lows, there are really steep places, uh, and up and down. Sometimes you slide and slide down those spots because, because they're just so steep. Uh, without the, the proper caution and seeing what's coming. But uh, we gave to Christ the safekeeping of our souls, but it's sometimes hard to give him the rest of the safekeeping in our lives. And we got to learn to do that, folks. I mean, uh, that's, that's, a big, that's a big thing. A God that's big enough to keep you out of hell <laughs> is a God that's big enough to keep you upright through your life. And so we have to just trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct our paths. We have to do that. We have to learn to fully trust the Lord. 
And in Psalm chapter 40, verse uh, 1 through the first part of uh, verse 4, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet <coughs> upon a rock and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. And we'll stop right there because it's just the first part of it. But it's important. And, and you notice that. It says he put a new song. He, he pulled, look at the different ways that he pulled us up and out. He pulled us up, right, out of a pit, out of a horrible pit. He pulled us up. Out of the miry place. So that tells you, number one, you were in a deep place where you couldn't get out. Number two, you were in the miry clay and you were stuck there. He pulled us up, out of that pit, out of what was holding us, that miry clay. And then it says, he set my feet on a rock and established my goings. He put us on a firm place where we could stand. A firm place where we can stand and not budge and not fall and not be stuck and, and, and unable to move. But he placed us there. He established our whole goings. Then he says, he put, uh, and he put, have put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And listen at this. I find this is a really great thing here. If you want people to trust in the Lord, I want you to see a little bit of a formula here. That God gives us. Listen to this. Because of this new song and all of these things, it says, Many shall see it. When we're talking about other people, right? We want other people to trust in God. Many people shall see it. They'll see your song. They'll see that you were pulled up out of a horrible pit. They'll see that you were out of the stuck, sticky, miry clay. And that, that he put you on. And it's through the praise of the Lord that they see this. Because in the praise of the Lord, we are thanking God and saying, He is so great. He is so powerful. He did this for me. This is, this is the psalmist saying, listen, I wait patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. He heard my cry. He brought me up. He did this. He did that. He did this. He did that. Are you seeing where it's going? We are seeing what has happened that God is doing through the praise that is going on. This, these verses are all praising the Lord because it's telling us what He's done. That's what praise is. Telling what He's done. Say He's great. He's powerful. He's a mighty fortress. He's a helper. He's a, you know, He's, He's a, a present help in the time of trouble. He's this and He's that. And listen what He did for me. I was here. I was in this situation. I couldn't move. I couldn't get out. I was stuck. He brought me up out of that horrible pit. He brought me up out of the thing that was holding me down. He brought me up and He set me on a solid rock. Then He took interest in me further. He didn't just rescue me like an animal that was abandoned on the side of the road that had been hit by a car. He, 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 he established my goings. He took more interest me in me than just my rescue. He took interest in my future. Amen. He gave me security in Him and then says, I'm going to make a way for your going. I'm going to show you where to go. He took interest in my future. This is praise of God from the lips of the psalmist. And listen what it says. Many shall see it and fear. Huh? You mean many shall see it and just automatically trust? No. It says many shall see it and fear. It's a good kind of a fear. It's not a, it's not a shake. It's a reverential fear of the power of God. 
Listen at that. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know what? When you find a full persuasion of Israel to God, it says that fear fell upon them first. Fear fell upon them because God spoke, God moved, God did something. It shook them to their core and they dropped to the ground and they trusted in Him. When you lose your fear of God, you will lose your trust in Him. Sure. Think about it. Why do we have so many people that just don't seem to trust the Lord? They don't fear. That's what it should do. It should spark a reverential fear of these things and the power that God really has. We talk about that power. We love that power, but we don't dwell enough on God's power and how mighty He is and that we could not even see Him in our flesh and live. That ought to grip our souls this very morning. That we can't even see God in the flesh and live. Because that's how powerful, how holy, and, and that's how perfect that He is. And how of the opposite we are. <laughs> that we would just drop and not live, cease to breathe. And we're going to see Him one day. Now many shall see Him. They need to see our prayer. They need to see our praise. They need to see how our, our, our praise of God in these things, that it should cause them to think, wow. And that little, that little hush of reverential fear come over them. God can do that. And many shall trust in Him. We need to keep that reverential fear of God. And we will keep our trust in Him. I want you to see that this morning. Blessed is the man, in verse 4, that maketh the Lord his trust. So we want to see that there's safety in God's person. Colossians 3.3, 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It will do us well to remember that we are hidden within, with Christ in God. And are hidden with that. He is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's our portion in the land of the living. He's our safety net, as well as an anchor in the storm. He is sometimes all that we have, and He is always all that we need. Sometimes God is all you have. There's no one else. No one else can do anything. No one else can help. No one else can do it. Sometimes we're in a, we're in a place where God is all that there is. But He is always all that we need. See, if you have Him, that's why it's so important to have Him. Because if you've got your trust in anything else, in anyone else... That means that you can put yourself in a position where you would be without help completely. <laughs> completely without help. Completely helpless. Because people will turn on you. They will. They, they, they just will. I've seen it. I've, I've watched it happen. Psalm 99, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 25 or 27, 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. There's safety in God. There's safety in God's word. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. In this verse, we find that our hiding place is found in God's word. Another great reason to be in your Bible. 
great reason to be in the Bible because you you can be hidden in there. It's, it's safety. It's safety in the Word of God. It is the Bible that guides us through those troubled times. It is the Bible that protects us in our trials and our tribulations. That's why we, we have to go there first. At the first sign of storm, we've got to get to the book. All through the storm, we've got to get to the book. It's just like if it's just like when the storms roll in and you've got to get to shelter. While we were in Chicago and you guys you guys had some rough weather, some of you had to seek shelter because there were warnings, there were possibilities of tornadoes touching down. And what do you do? You, know, you go to the basement. If you don't have a basement, you've got to go somewhere where you're away from glass and all of that. But it's, it's designed to seek protection in the storm. If you're out in the storm, you want to get to where your head's covered and you want to get, you know, you want to get out of the rain and you seek shelter from the rain. You get out where the, where the rain is being blocked. You want to hide yourself from the rain. You want to get into protection. So if we find ourselves are already hidden in God and we get into the word of God, we'll find that there's safety there as well. This is our hiding place. It's like the cleft in the rock. This the, the book is that's what it is. When we when we get into the Bible, it's just like God did with Moses and he put him, took him up, put him in the cleft of the rock as he passed by. Remember we talked about that? That's kind of like what the book does for us. When we get in the book, in our time of need, in our time of trouble, in our time of distress, we get into the book. It's almost like God is just shielding you from everything else. Like the Bible is the cover. The Bible would represent God's hand. And you notice there's a little cleft there. That's where you and I go. And then God just puts us there and says, okay, I think we'll just, we'll put you over here for a little bit. Because this is a mean storm. While I deal with the storm, you guys just, you know, you guys just chill. <laughs> You guys just chill over here. <laughs> I got this. And he takes care of it. So we got to understand that. That there's safety in God's word. In our fortress we have several things. We've got a sanctuary. A fortress is built for habitation. It's built for that. When you build a fort as a kid, you're wanting to get in there and it's to, 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 you know, to not just to play, but to act out everything else that you needed to do that will fit the, the model of what you do. It's to be inhabited. No one builds a fort and then don't get in it. Why would you spend all the time building a fort and not get in it? That would not be cool. That would not be fun. That's a lot of work. The work to build the fort, it, it, the, the fun is the reward of the work. You see the vision of what we do. We need a fort. It's got to be made of something. Whether you've got, whether you've got cardboard boxes, whether you uh, build it out with, with tree sticks and, and, and different things, or you find random stuff around the house and random stuff out in the yard, wherever you're at, and you, you, you make that fort your own because you have an idea already of what you need it for. You know where the windows need to be. You need clear lanes for shooting, of course. Because you know, I, I don't know any kid that didn't build a fort that didn't have some kind of a warfare going on with a gun, plastic guns and or whatever. Right? So you build it for your need. You get in there. It's a design for habitation. So we're going to see a few things within that sanctuary. We're going to see the people of the sanctuary. We see the saved. Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Amen. Woo! How about that? That's the name of the Lord is a strong tower. 
The righteous will run to the name of the Lord and in doing so will run into a strong tower and be safe. Boy, you just, you didn't realize the name of God would do that for you, did you? But it's not for the self-righteous. In Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Our righteousnesses are not good enough. Nowhere near good enough. We need God's righteousness. So that we can see the people in the sanctuary, the place of the sanctuary. We are in Christ Jesus in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're in Christ. We're in God the Father. John 10, 29 and 30. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You're hid in Christ. Christ is hid in God. You have, you have all of this barrier around you. When you really stop to think about how well God has you covered, it's pretty awesome. Because you're not only in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're in Jesus Christ, who's in God. You have a threefold manner of protection around you at all times. Isn't that great? That ought to make somebody happy. Think about how protected you are. Think about what you have in God. The demons have held out all of them. At the same time with the power of the devil himself can do anything to get you out of there. Nobody can get you out of there. Nobody. Not all the demons in hell and the devil himself simultaneously trying to pull could not even budge the hand of God let alone get you out of Jesus' hand, let alone get to the very interior where the Holy Spirit himself has bound you and sealed you. Nobody can touch you except God allow it. That's something you have in the sanctuary. We are in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6, and it raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are also in a secret place. We are in a secret place. You know what? We talk about, we talk about our, our own secret places that we have. But listen, where you're at, we are in a secret place. In Psalm 91.1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You are in God's secret place. Think about it. You're in God's secret place. Nobody knows where that is. You know, God buried Moses Nobody knows where it is. True. Nobody knows. And rightly so. You think, well, that's terrible. He, he doesn't have anybody to honor him. Well, if they found Moses' bones, they would worship them. Yep. They would have worshipped them instead of the God of Moses. I don't think Moses would have even wanted that. Think about that. There's places that no one knows, that only God knows. And that's where he puts us. Safe. Colossians 3.3, 3, we talked about it. For you're dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are hedged about. Job 1.10, hast thou not made an hedge about him? and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. 
Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance and is increased in the land. You know, Satan couldn't do anything because God had protection all around him. <laughs> on everything he did. Not just him. Not just his family. But all the work of his hands. All of his inheritance. All of his blessings. All of what he's done. All of the increase that God blessed him with. Everything. And you, you might as well say this because... Everything that comes from God is perfect, which includes perfect provisional protection of absolutely everything that God gives you. Think about that. Everything God gave Job, he protected. He put a barrier around. Now, we all know it's not a grass hedge. That's just stupid. It's a, it's a barrier that God puts there that the devil himself can't get through. Amen. So who else is gonna? We're lower than the angels. We don't have power like that. But even he himself, the prince of the power of the air, couldn't do a thing against Job. Well, yeah, how am I supposed to do that? You've got him caged in this hedge of protection and everything that he has and you've blessed the work in his hands and you've done all this goodness and you've protected every single thing he couldn't even touch the goodness he couldn't even touch the fields he couldn't even touch any of it because God had that protection over it everything we get from God has a protection over it amen I wish I could say that that protection is forever. It is on our soul. As we found out, God can remove that protection. We can't take that protection over us, over our family, over all of that for granted. In this, we must fear. This alone should cause us to have a fear of the Lord. That God doesn't have to keep that protection on anything else but your soul. What did he say? Your soul and your life. What did he say? You can touch all that he has. You can even afflict him. But you can't take his life. That's right. You won't touch his life. You can touch everything else around him. Even the lives of the people he loved. Think about it. You, you wonder why we pray for our families? You wonder why we do that? Why we should be motivated? This ought to motivate us to stay right with God, to, to, to hate evil things, to walk away from those things, to fear the Lord because he can actually take those away. He'll protect your life. Your soul's protected no matter what. But you know what? When we start doing wrong, God can start removing those protections and watch those areas fall and hit and get suffered and be damaged and even removed. We gotta be careful. What that should make us fear the Lord enough that we would stay right. A good, healthy fear of the Lord that He might take that away should drive us to good works, drive us towards holiness, drive us towards Him that we might always seek to be in His favor and not have those things removed where the devil could just level it all and take it all away. That ought, to, that ought to kind of scare us this morning. I wish I could. I wish I could go around and tell people things that would make them fear the Lord. Because I desire to see all people fear the Lord. That's what you should do. We should fear Him and the power that He has. Because you made a hedge about it. His house. All that he had on every side. On, he didn't leave any gaps in that protection until he had to remove it. That's why I always tell you, listen, nothing can happen to you or I unless it's already gone through God's filtering process. 
It can't happen unless it's been allowed to happen. And God's reasons for it are, we don't always understand them, but his thought processes are different than ours. That's why it's so hard to understand what he does sometimes. But we have to know that whatever happens to us, God is doing something. Whether it's a test of your faith. And there's many, we've seen many different aspects uh, all throughout the scriptures and in different individuals for absolutely different things altogether. And whether it's just obedience, whether it's your resolve for him, uh, you know, like the three Hebrew children, or are you, are you going to bow uh, when your life is threatened? Or are you going to have resolve to stand for me? And they had resolve, and they also had a deliverer. Right. And he was right there with them in that fire. He didn't just protect them from afar. He got right up with them. Just walking around. Just walking around. And we've seen the praise of God in prison shake the bands loose. And the doors open. Everybody's free. In the midst of the hardship, in the midst of that problem, in the midst of that situation, those problems, even though they seem dire, our attitude within it could mean our extended stay or our immediate release. Think about it. But there's different things. We saw Abraham, he was his obedience was tested with the sacrifice of Isaac. And he was right there ready to do it. He went all the way up to the point that it was about to go down. And God said, okay, I see now you're going to obey me. We forget that stuff. Oh, well, you know, we learned that stuff in junior church and a kid's church. And then you grow up and everything that it should have had an effect in stayed in your mind, you just dismiss as not important. Some of those things that you learn, I mean, think about it. Some of the most important stuff you can ever learn happens in junior church and the kids programs. That's when you first learn it. That's when you're first struck at the, whoa, God did that? Wow. Think about what, did you hear that story? Did you hear what God let him do? Because you have the excitement built for the word. What happens, adults? As you get to be an adult, the excitement is drained from your being. By work, by responsibilities, by bills, by all of that. You feel like you just can't have fun anymore. You don't know where the fun's gone. Your excitement's gone out of everything. Where is that zeal, folks? We need to keep it alive. I've worked really hard to keep the zeal and excitement alive in my own life. And I can get excited about the things of the Word of God. Still. Because he still wows me. That's right. Amen. Even more than I ever got wowed as a child, I've been wowed by the things that God showed me in the Bible. Wow. It, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what praising can do. Huh? I'm sure we'll be hearing that later. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. That whole praise of the Lord can cause those things that we desire to happen to happen in others. And it can keep ourselves reminded that we need to trust in the Lord. We need to remind ourselves that God could pull these things away and pull these blessings. Uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That we don't want to have the blessings taken away from us. We want them given to us and protected. That's what we want. 
I mean, I don't know anybody that doesn't want their family protected. If you don't want your family protected, you're just a rotten human being. Huh. Rotten human being. No good is in you if you can't love your family and want them protected or would wish harm on any of your family. It's awful to even think that there's people out there like that. We need, we need to pray. We need to have the fear of the Lord in our own lives that we might trust in Him more. You know, I've been through some scary times. I, I just have in my life. I've, I've been through some. I've been through some stuff. And sometimes you get afraid, don't you? When you go through stuff that's that's a little bit scary, you just you get afraid. And we think, oh, well, you know, God's not given us the spirit of fear. Well, that's true. He hasn't given us the spirit to be ruled by fear and to only fear. That's not that's not the purpose of it. But He's not given us in ourselves. The point where we get rid of fear altogether. Because there is one fear that we should remain to have and hold on to. And that is the fear of the Lord. We don't need to fear what man will do to us. God tells us what we should fear and what we shouldn't. And I will tell you whom you shall fear. Fear him that after he hath killed hath the power to cast into hell. I say unto you, fear him. Right. He's not giving you the spirit of just being afraid all the time. God doesn't want that. But he doesn't want us to walk around fearless. Because that means we don't have a fear of God. Our fear will drive our trust. It seems odd, doesn't it? See, I have to fear in order to trust. Well, it wouldn't fear make me. I mean, you could really try to analyze things and try to analyze your way out of it. But that's what it says. They'll see, they'll fear, and they'll trust. So that tells me that we need to see, we need to fear, and we will trust. Amen. We're gonna. I, I didn't get all the way through it, so we'll we'll pick up. Uh, we'll pick up next uh, next week. On, on in our fortress, we have security. That's where we're, uh, we're leaving off. Um, but I, I, I hope you'll take these things and realize some things today. Let God just stir that around in your heart today, and let it prepare for you for what's coming next from the pulpit. I think it's going to be amazing. I don't know what it is, but I already know God's got something great. I, I, I know it. I, I, you don't. You just. You just have to know that. So let's pray, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the day.